Hello everyone and welcome back to Destiny. You might be clicking on this video because of the thumbnail that says Destiny 2 is great. There's a lot of really odd headlines saying that players are disappointed with Destiny 2, and in fact these headlines from these major publications are doing so much damage that it's getting people to think that players that are playing the game don't want to get Destiny 2 anymore and that the game should be cancelled. This is really absurd. It's also the easiest headline to print, so I don't blame them for doing that. Sure, the game has issues, but this is their baseline for the game, and if this is what they're starting with, we are in for quite a treat in September. In this video, I want to go over my assessment of the beta and what we experienced, and how I think it'll translate to the final product. And the format of this video is going to be a little bit different than you're used to. This is more of a free rant about the game. I want this to sort of have a natural conversational flow, so it's not going to really have the sort of like topic one, two, three breakdown as clearly and distinctly as I normally would make it. But I do plan on touching on every major talking point, so let's get into it. So I want to start off with the positive notes. From a beta standpoint, this was a fantastic delivery. The beta looked incredible, it had that polish that we come to expect from Bungie nowadays, that was definitely intact. Homecoming was the most breathtaking part of this beta. I'm kind of glad they made you play it before you could do anything else with the beta, because it's clear that they want to kind of get rid of that stigma that they've had with story. And if you had any doubts about the quality of Destiny 2's story campaign, Playing through the mission, the cinematics, and presenting us with the scale of story that it is, I think all of those doubts could be put to rest. Now, aside from that, they've also evolved in the way that they're presenting their world to us. We saw Nessus, one of the destinations, and while it is one of the smaller destinations, it was still very impressive the way it was laid out. We saw about a good quarter of the space that we had access to, and a good portion more if you glitched out of the area, but you got the sense that this is a much more expansive space, and it makes a lot more sense in its layout. So, every destination isn't going to be a giant donut like they are in Destiny 1. I was really impressed that during the strike, when you're on the opposite west side of the map, you can look all the way to the east and see the crash tail end of the Exodus Black ship, and know that you could walk there right now if you wanted to. And also, it kind of blows my mind that this is probably the smallest destination in Destiny 2. When they revealed the European Dead Zone, they did sell it as the largest destination that they've built to date by a factor of two. So, the EDZ is probably going to be two to three times bigger than Nessus, if not more. And that's only considering what's visible on the surface level. We were able to glitch into many of these sort of hidden caverns and lost sectors, and so that's going to provide a lot more depth and a lot more dimensionality to the spaces. Now, finding these lost sectors and secrets and glitching into places so easily has given us a bit of a backlash. It seems like people are thinking that Nessus is incomplete, the game is not ready to ship, what's going on with the space? Well, keep in mind that this is a beta, and they loaded in the files that were necessary for the beta, so that means everything that is normally, quote-unquote, visible to you when you're on the inverted spire strike. That does include things like the Exodus Black Ship, which you can see perfectly from the very west end of the map if you sort of scope in over to the east side. So that asset is there, but then if you glitch into the area where the ship is, you'll notice there's a lot of things missing there because you're not supposed to be there during the strike. So the entire map of Nessus was not loaded in, most likely so that the beta file is as small as it can be. I mean, 13 gigabytes for a beta is still a pretty tall order, so if they didn't need those spaces for the Inverted Spire Strike, there's no reason to really deliver them. However, the final game will most likely feature the complete map on every activity. So that's one example of people sort of freaking out, when we need to collectively realize that the whole purpose of a beta test is to make sure that the game is running properly. Yeah, we're getting a nice taste of the content and that's sort of like a dual purpose thing where Bungie can get our reactions towards the content as well, but for the most part they want to make sure the servers work, they want to make sure the game doesn't crash too much, they want to make sure that the sandbox works the way it should. And of course our constructive criticism in that department is what's going to help Bungie finalize their game, and that's sort of the purpose of this video. So let's go ahead and talk about the actual content of the beta. First off, I want to mention the enemies that we face in the PvE activities. I'm more of a PvE guy myself, so this is a pretty important topic for me. We face the Fallen, the Vex, and the Cabal. 
The Cabal had a number of really interesting new enemy types, and I'm sure we haven't seen all of them. We have new Sniper Scions. Those big gladiators with the sort of meat cleavers are really fun to fight. I like the new Phalanxes with their sort of crit spot on the shield. The new Centurions were no joke, and the new Colossus was probably one of the more devastating enemies out there. And the War Beasts are really fun to fight against, especially since they sort of just throw hordes of them at you. So kudos to Bungie for making the Red Legion really formidable to fight against. We also saw some more Fallen. I really like this new ragtag group of Fallen that we're fighting. They have new enemy types like Marauders and Wrenches, and I'm pretty sure one of them went full sprint ahead at me at one point. The Captains are no joke now. Instead of teleporting away to sort of recover their shield and hiding, they kind of teleport towards you to do even more damage to you. It's pretty nuts. Also, during that strike, we fight the Vex. They had some really interesting new moves for the Minotaur and the Harpies. Aside from that, we didn't get anything really that looked incredibly new, but I'm guessing we haven't seen everything there is to see about the new Vex enemies. And then aside from that, we haven't really seen the Hive yet. We've seen a split second of some footage that we saw on Titan. We saw what looked like a Hive Knight, but with giant bat wings, so it's possible that he'll end up flying around and provide a sort of different combat dynamic. Now, of course, there's going to be those people who wish we got brand new enemy races, but this is the world of Destiny. These are the four alien races who have invaded our solar system. Now, if we end up leaving our solar system in a future release, then I fully expect new alien races to be introduced. But for now, this is what we have. So it's really nice that Bungie is taking up that challenge and is really striving to make the enemy encounters much more interesting. I really enjoyed the encounter with Protheon. I love that he basically turned it into a giant fanatic at the end. I thought that was really neat. And ultimately, even though it didn't provide us any sort of unique gameplay mechanics, the overall strike itself was very interesting and had a lot of different variation between the different environments. I mean, this particular strike is not going to be known for its strike boss. It's going to be known for the drill section. So I guess this is making me realize that I would ultimately prefer a much more interesting and unique experience throughout the entire strike and if they can successfully deliver on that like they did with the inverted spire i'm okay with a less mechanically heavy boss i also liked what they did with the power level we were at 200 light and the encounters were at recommended 210 i think they did that on purpose so they can sort of turn up the dial and see how we reacted to a slightly more challenging encounter i mean a lot of us are veteran destiny players and so i think they wanted to make sure that we didn't find the game too easy I thought it was the perfect amount of challenge. The sort of light differential of 210 versus 200 was perfectly represented. That's what I expect in the full game. So kudos there for nailing that feeling of being, you know, just underpowered. And speaking of power, I suppose that sort of leads into the conversation of weapons. And so I suppose the big question that we're trying to answer here with our experience in the beta is whether or not the kinetic energy and power weapon slots is an improvement over the primary special and heavy slots in Destiny 1. Well, my initial impressions with having a kinetic and energy slots are very positive. I love the dynamic of being able to switch from a hand cannon to an auto rifle and vice versa. It's making me realize that a lot of my weapon loadouts that I use in Destiny 1 are more based on range than anything else. If I'm going to have a scout rifle, I will most likely have a shotgun in my special slot. If I'm going to be wielding an auto rifle, I'll probably have a sniper rifle. And it was really nice to be able to have the weapons that I want without being restricted in that way. For a lot of my playthroughs with the Inverted Spire, I found myself using a Scout Rifle or Pulse Rifle for my Kinetic, and then using a Solar Hand Cannon. For me, that was the most rewarding loadout. I would use my Scout Rifle for the most part, and then if I found a Centurion with a Solar Shield, I would switch to that, give the old guy a couple taps, and then switch back to my Scout Rifle to finish him off. And I found that that actually worked really well when switching over to PvP. And also what I found really worked well in PvP was the Power Slot. Now that was the thing that Bungie was really challenging themselves with by switching to this new system. They kind of had to group all of their specials and heavies into one slot. We already knew about this, but how does it actually play? Well, in the Crucible, I found it to be perfect. The two minute timer was spot on. I found every single one of the power weapons to be devastating. My least favorite of the bunch for PvP unexpectedly is the grenade launcher, but I think that's mostly because we mostly don't really know how to use it that well in PvP, at least I'm not so great at it. Uh, I'm sure once the game comes out, we'll have a lot of videos posted online, maybe by me as well, on how to best aim the gun in PvP, maybe bounce it off a certain way. But every time I saw someone pull a shotgun or a fusion rifle ammo, I was running the other direction. I love that you see a little light in front of the gun, letting you know that they have it locked and loaded and ready to go. 
And perhaps least expected of all, I grew a love for fusion rifles yet again. I even went back to Destiny 1, and in the story playlist this week with Specialist, it's sort of wreck shop, so it was really satisfying to get a whole new appreciation for that weapon type. And for the first time, I'm actually really excited to test out fusion rifles in Destiny 2. Now, on the flip side, when it came to power weapons in PvE, I was a little bit disappointed. Well, for the most part, it had to do with how much ammo you would get during the encounters. It was really nice for them to start you with the strike at about a magazine and a half worth of bullets, but honestly, aside from that, you would find maybe two or three other ammo bricks, each of them giving you two or three shots for a sniper, and maybe one rocket. And so, that was really disappointing because, I mean, Destiny is a game where you're supposed to feel powerful. And these power weapons are really supposed to be there to help you do that, it's just a shame that you don't get as much of them during the encounter and often are left with no ammo in that slot. Now, game director Luke Smith did respond to this earlier in the week, assuring us that the final game will have much more PvE ammo. And I want to say it was in the previous Bungie podcast where they mentioned that they were toying around with, like, majors dropping more power ammo more often, which is great, you know, turn up those dials for those harder enemies to fight, but also give us more ammo per brick. I think that's sort of important. My quick answer to this is that every single ammo brick should give you a full magazine of the weapon you have equipped. If a full magazine is too much to have, then that weapon is not balanced properly against the other power weapons. But overall, I'm a big fan of the new weapon slots. I think they work really well, and I'm genuinely super stoked to try out like different loadouts and see what works best in different situations. Now, of course, the second half of the Guardian Arsenal are your abilities. That has to do with your class choice, your subclass choice, and really the player's ability to take advantage of those perks. Some people are saying that they need to completely rework what the Hunter class ability even is. Their viability in PvE, I've made an entire video going over that. And yet there are people in the comment of that video that say that I'm in denial, I'm just sad that my favorite class is not doing so well. My favorite class is Titan. I like Hunter because I see a lot of promise in PvE, and I believe the Striker does suffer from a lot of those same issues as the Hunter, but because the Hunter doesn't have an obvious support class, it's getting all the attention. Having said that, I do have a large amount of criticism towards the current subclass system. And believe it or not, my feedback does not center around ability cooldowns, with a couple minor exceptions that I'll go over in a little bit. But things felt a little off because, for some reason, Bungie had decided to not include armor that reduces cooldowns for any of the abilities. While Intellect, Discipline, and Strength are no longer stats in the game, you still get armor pieces that reduce those cooldowns. We've seen earlier screenshots that show things like class ability cooldowns being reduced, grenade ability cooldowns being reduced, so those things are going to be in the game, we just didn't have them during the beta. So ultimately, you're still going to be able to build your character up the way you want with the cooldowns that matter to your playstyle. If you want to dodge a lot more often with your hunter, well then guess what? You want to build up armor pieces that have that cooldown built into every single piece. Also, we don't have any confirmation on how those systems are going to work yet, so we still have to wait and see. It's not really worth judging it yet. So, in short, there is an issue, but I don't expect Bungie to touch it until we actually get into the end game of the final product and see how those armor builds really affect the cooldowns. The couple exceptions I was referring to is specifically about the Crucible. We played Countdown and Control, and oftentimes, whether or not you were on the winning or losing team, if you weren't in the top 50 percentile of getting kills, you probably didn't get your super the entire match. I think we were able to assess that supers naturally grow without any kills to 8 minutes before they charge when they were 5 minutes in Destiny 1. I think that's a bit overkill, I would say maybe reduce it down to 7. And that's not really partially because I want to use my super more, I mean I do, supers are awesome, but one of the utilities of a super is to sort of try to turn the tide of battle, and in control, considering the 8 minute timer, it would help if we could get that around the 5 minute mark, that would leave us plenty of time to try to sort of make a comeback. I was surprised with the amount of matches where we did start to make a comeback, but we just didn't have enough time to seal the deal. And that was partially because once we became coordinated as a team, we just didn't have enough time to get the kills we needed. But again, we didn't have any armor that would reduce our super cooldown. We probably will have access to that later in the game. I mean, if I told you to go put your year one momentum gear on and go to the Crucible, you probably wouldn't have a great time. 
So honestly, I can say that I have no issues there again until we see the final product. But I really wish that Bungie took this as an opportunity to give us a clearer picture of what that endgame experience would look like. Now the issue that I do have is with how powerful your abilities are. Since most of your supers are roaming supers, they don't do as much damage in each individual hit, but I did still find it very satisfying with the amount of DPS I would get. The only thing that felt a little underpowered were grenades. And I'm not talking about Crucible, I'm talking about PvE. Grenades should be much more powerful in PvE. But again, the beta was 10 light above, and that does make a huge difference towards the endgame. So again, I can't really judge that quite yet. What I can judge is the nature of the abilities themselves within the subclass trees. As I mentioned, I am a Titan main in Destiny 1, and I was unfortunately very underwhelmed at both the Striker and the Sentinel. More so the Sentinel, but definitely the Striker. Now, I don't want to go into every single subclass and every little minute detail because this video would be probably twice as long as it is. But in short, the Striker didn't feel as powerful. As you can see here, Fists of Havoc is awesome. I love the new way the super works, but the rest of the subclass leaves something to be desired. I'm not a big fan of the shoulder charge override for the melee. I miss the feeling of just punching something super hard with a bunch of electricity and knocking them back. And you still technically get that sensation with Shoulder Charge, but because it's the melee override, there's no reason for it to be weaker than it was in Destiny 1. I mean, if I have to sprint at something at top speed, it should do more damage than just a regular punch from a different subclass. So initially, not a huge fan, but I do love that I have two grenades and the new Pulse Grenade is awesome. So perhaps, just like with everything else, it just takes a little bit of getting used to. I do admit I didn't play a ton with the Striker, but from my first impressions, they weren't so great. Again, we're going to have to wait till the final product to see what maybe how the second subclass tree works. But anyways, moving on to the Sentinel, I was also very disappointed. While I loved the Fists of Havoc, I really did not like Sentinel Shield at all. The highlights from that super is the throwing of the shield and also blocking, which actually blocks a lot of damage. I mean, Protheon was just shooting directly at me with full force, and my shield was blocking all of it. So that was definitely very gratifying. Sadly, we only have one shield to throw. I mean, you can time it to get it to two, and maybe even cooldowns with armor pieces could help that further. And the second subclass tree gives you a second shield toss, so you could end up having three or four shield tosses if you time them right. But I really didn't love the sort of R1 regular attack. I found it slower and clunkier than Arc Blade. That's kind of what I compared it to initially. And yeah, if you land all your hits and you have three enemies in a row that are perfectly positioned, it's very satisfying. But in short, I think it's sort of a jack-of-all-trades super and a master of none. Moving on to the Warlock, I actually loved Dawnblade. I thought it was almost flawless. The mid-air dodge is super useful, and I'm going to love the ground pound that comes later on with the second subclass tree. That also regenerates your health, by the way, when you use it. That's going to be a huge deal. You can pair that with Empowering Rift and really get a lot of work done. I thought Voidwalker was fantastic. I love the overcharge on the grenade. Overall, the Warlock class kind of got the best deal out of this. So if you want to be absolutely flawless and powerful in every situation, go with Warlock. And then we have the Hunter, which I've mentioned earlier. I do have an entire video on that. So you can check that out if you want to learn my full opinions on how that's going to work out. But in short, the Gunslinger doesn't feel super useful in very many situations. And the Arc Strider was actually a lot more intuitive and a lot more useful and a lot more combat effective than I thought initially would be possible. Also, the Arc Staff Super is very devastating in PvE and he can clear a ton of adds in the entire super, mainly because you have the super for so long. I do also agree that something needs to happen with the dodge ability that's a little bit different than it is right now. Many have pointed out that the Dawnblade gets a 10 second cooldown on their midair dodge, and that is honestly a very good point, and that's why I think they need to add something else to the dodge system. Also, the other criticism is the fact that the Hunter doesn't have an ability that is sort of like team shared, and the dodge is very selfish, so what could they do to make that more effective to the rest of your team? Well, they could make Marksman Dodge re-equip all the weapons that are equipped to all of your fire team members that are nearby, not just you. Also, Gambler's Dodge could restore the melee recharge on not just you, but also your nearby teammates. If Hunter is focused on DPS, this is a fantastic way to up everybody's DPS at the same time. I mean, just imagine shooting your bullet, and right where you think you're about to run out of bullets, you get a Marksman Dodge happen nearby, and you get a full clip right away. 
That's just one idea to help the dodges stay the way that they are and stay just as useful to the hunter, but then if you are nearby your allies, you are going to contribute in a real way. That is one example of how I think they could improve the dodge system without it having to be reworked from the ground up. Also, it would be nice if one of the Gunslinger's perks would maybe recharge the dodge much faster on precision kills. Maybe. Just a thought. And I think that's pretty much all of the topics that I wanted to touch on. I mainly just wanted to sort of address a lot of the criticism out there that I feel is a little unfounded and a little blown out of proportion. A lot of people that are sort of newer to the Destiny community don't perhaps realize the sort of rapport that the community has with the development team. We hold Bungie to very high standards because we've seen what is possible when they put their mind to it and when they listen. And to me, Destiny 2 is a product of Bungie listening to its community to a certain extent, and this is the real important part, because at a certain point they have to go with their gut and deliver their vision of the franchise. I love the beta overall, there are problems, hopefully Bungie will address most of them before launch. Aside from that, I'm very much looking forward to Destiny 2. I am going to be locked and loaded September 6th and ready to just consume this game whole. Destiny 2 is more Destiny, and that's what I'm looking forward to. Thank you very much for watching. Please share your thoughts on what I'm talking about down below in the comments. It really does mean a lot to me if I missed on anything or if I got something wrong. So drop a like if you enjoyed this video and subscribe for more Destiny content. And I will see you all next time.